So in this lecture, we're going to talk about um, non-parametric permutation testing. Um, we're going to talk about the mechanics of permutation testing. One of the um, sort of, I don't know, I wouldn't call it a disadvantage, but kind of an awkward uh, feature of permutation testing. Um, and we're going to spend quite some time in MATLAB looking at the mechanics of uh, permutation testing. Just by way of quick uh, review, two major advantages of permutation testing in um, electrophysiology or neuroscience data analyses is that we don't need to make any assumptions about the distributions that characterize our um, uh, the data, and we don't need to make any assumptions about the distributions of parameters that would characterize the the um, results under the null hypothesis. This is because we are going to generate our own distributions of null hypothesis statistical values, so we don't need to make any assumptions. Um, a second advantage is that permutation testing is very amenable to multiple comparisons, um, corrections, that should say corrections, not testing. Um, that will multiple comparisons issues is going to be the topic of the next lecture. We're not going to uh, we're not going to get quite that far in this lecture. So I mentioned um, in the previous lecture that uh, there are very broadly speaking two kinds of analyses that you'll do. You want to look for discrete um, dis um, differences. So are these two conditions different, or is the activity in these two frequency bands different, um, or um, uh, this more continuous measure like a correlation. So right now, or actually for the rest of this lecture, I'm only going to be talking about this discrete situation where you're asking, is the activity different from condition A compared to condition B? Um, in fact, what we are going to be asking is, is the activity different from electrode A compared to electrode B? But the same principles that I'll discuss here are also applicable to this more continuous um, situation. So let's think about uh, this situation where we have these two different um, uh, categories, two different conditions, um, in our case now two different electrodes. So what is the null hypothesis? I mentioned, I discussed a little bit in the previous lecture that this is, you know, it, it seems like a, a stupid, trivial question, what is the null hypothesis? But sometimes it is actually a little bit tricky to um, to consider uh, what the null hypothesis um, actually is. In this situation where we are looking at, um, so this situation where we have this discrete case of, of two different um, uh, variables or sets of variables, the null hypothesis is that the data are actually drawn from one single distribution. So it would look something like this. So let's say this is our null hypothesis. In reality, um, this, well, this sort of reality of the null hypothesis, whatever that means, there's really only one distribution. So there's just one sort of thing and we're plucking data randomly out from this one distribution. And so cutting them up into <clears throat> A and B like this, making this discretization is meaningless and arbitrary. <clears throat> because in reality, the data are just come from one distribution. So this is just, you know, we might as well, uh, this is just picking at random. So if that were true, if the null hypothesis were true, what would that mean about the, the condition labels and the relationship between the condition labels or channel labels and the actual data? It would mean that um, this labeling of electrode A and electrode B is totally arbitrary, totally meaningless and random. So that means we could swap any data point from this pile to this pile, or from this pile to this pile, and it wouldn't matter in terms of any kind of statistical test that we want to do between these two things. It wouldn't matter because we know that these are really drawn, or we assume based on null hypothesis, that these are really drawn from a single distribution. So we could pick one data point from this pile and one data point from this pile, and we can swap the data points. Actually, in practice, we don't really swap the data points themselves. We swap the labels associated with the data points, but you get the idea. And if the null hypothesis were true, this wouldn't matter because the fact that this data point was in this bin was just chance. It was just arbitrary, and it's, it's, it's not a sensible um, label. So of course we can swap these around and it doesn't matter. 
this is just an, another way of um, um, pictorially representing this concept. So if the, the null hypothesis were true, so the null hypothesis states that we just have one big di happy distribution from which all these data are drawn. And putting this line here is meaningless to say that these are separate from these. This doesn't matter. So we could swap these guys um, and it doesn't matter. But the, the more interesting hypothesis is that, um, in fact, these there are really two distributions here for condition A and condition B. And so therefore, when we swap data points or if we swap labels for two data points, that actually would have a negative effect on the statistical value. It would change the statistical value. <clears throat> okay, so I think you get the idea. So that, in fact, is permutation testing. You just shuffle or permute the um, whatever the labeling is between uh, data point and uh, and condition or channel or time point or whatever, um, and then you compute your condition difference statistic. So you swap a bunch of these and you compute a test statistic. So let's say a t-test between these guys and these guys, and under the null hypothesis, you would expect a t-value of of zero. Um, and um, and so reshuffling uh, wouldn't really affect the value of the t statistic. Okay, and then I say repeat, repeat, repeat. Um, of course, you want to repeat this multiple times because if you would do, even if the null hypothesis were true, if you do one shuffling, of course, you know, in theory, you would expect that t value to be 0 0.00000. But in reality, you wouldn't get a t-value of exactly zero uh, because there is sampling distribution or sampling uh, variability. There's errors, there's outliers, and all sorts of things. And so, so you might get a t-value of like two, which is you know fairly high. It might be less than p 0.05, depending on the degrees of freedom. And so. Uh, so that's a bit um, uh, awkward, right? So, so you don't want to rely on only one permuted value. Um, you want to repeat this procedure over and over and over again. Um, each time you randomly swap all the labels for all these data points and recompute the, the t value or whatever is the, uh, the test statistic. And let's say you do this a thousand times and then you get this distribution of t values um, under the null hypothesis. And so now you can see that, uh, oh, now you can see where this distribution comes from that I was um, discussing in the previous lecture. So with typical um, parametric statistics, you are assuming the distribution. So you assume that the distribution looks, I don't know, Gaussian or you know whatever is appropriate for the statistic that you're performing. Um, and here we don't make any assumptions. We just shuffle the data and we run the statistics and then we see what we get. And then this is our distribution. And now we can compare the observed value that we see in the real data without doing any, uh, without doing any shuffling. And then we say, well, if this is you know, at the tail of the distribution or maybe at the negative tail, we can say that this observed statistic value is very unlikely to occur given the null hypothesis. It could occur, right? So there's always a chance. This is your, you know, this is set by your alpha error. But we can say this is far enough away from the center of this distribution in normalized units. So we measure this in normalized units. How far away is this from the center of the distribution? And then we can um, attach a p-value to that. And then we say, well, you know, there's only, I don't know, a 1.3% a probability that we would get a statistic value at least this large, this extreme, if the null hypothesis were true. And here's the distribution we get uh, when we assume that the null hypothesis is true. So you, you might be wondering how many um, iterations should I do? So obviously you want to do more than one, right? We discussed that already. In fact, the first time you shuffle, the first permutation you do, you, maybe you'll get a value all the way out here. It's possible, you know, it's not likely, but it's it's certainly possible. So you want to do a lot. So the question is, how many of these do you need to do? 50, 500, 5 million? Um, this is what I mentioned at the very beginning um, of this lecture, that there's one kind of awkward 
feature of uh, permutation testing. And that is if you repeat this procedure multiple times, you're going to get different distributions. They won't differ enormously, right? They'll be generally pretty similar, but the distributions can differ uh, or, or will necessarily differ. Um, whether that has any um, impact on whether you would call your findings significant, unfortunately, depends a bit on how, you know, where exactly your statistic lies. If your observed value is here, right in the middle, then it doesn't really matter if these values, this distribution, the empirical distribution changes a little bit from permutation to perm, from, you know, sort of test to test. And if your observed value is all the way out here, uh, then also it doesn't matter. You can see if this distribution changes from test to test, this thing is always going to be significant. But, you know, you can imagine that if your value, your observed statistic value is like right here, somewhere around here, let's say, like right on the border, somewhere right around 0.05, it can happen that you can run the test once and it be, it's, it's technically statistically significant, p less than 0.05, and then you run the test Again, you run permutation testing again, um, and it ends up being non-significant. So maybe your p-value would be like 0.057 or something like that. So this is a bit of an awkward thing that if you run the statistics over and over and over again, you're going to get slightly different results. They won't really differ uh, hugely, but, but they can differ. So then you, you probably think, well, you know, we just add more iterations. Unfortunately, that, that does help, but it doesn't really solve the, the, the problem. So what I'm plotting here is the Z value, which is the normalized distance of this thing away from the center of this distribution. And this is actually really just a normal um, kind of standard Z value. So we take this data and we subtract it from the mean of this distribution and then we divide by the standard deviation of this distribution. We'll see this in, in MATLAB in a few minutes. So that's the Z value, basically how far away this is from the from the center of this distribution as a function of the number of iterations. So of course I reran this test over and over. You can see it's more variable when we have a small number of iterations, but even up to 3000, there's still quite some variability from test to test. So, and here you see a distribution of the Z values and their corresponding P values um, for exactly the same data. I just ran this permutation test over and over again. Um, I think I don't remember. I might have picked maybe 2000. I think I did somewhere in the middle here. So this was, let's just pretend it was 2000. So I did a permutation test with um, 2000 iterations. So 2000 times permuting. And then I did that whole sequence of 2000 permutations, uh, lots and lots of times, several dozens of times. And this is what you see here. So this, you know, this Z value here would be one point in this distribution. So you can see this distribution is not, it's not enormously wide, right? But it is, of course, different time to time. And it can actually happen. So here, you know, I, I could have picked a point that was a little bit more closer to significance, but you can see, you know, let's say your threshold was 0.08, you know, so it can happen that the the same data would be deemed non-significant or sometimes significant just by rerunning the test over and over again. So this is admittedly a slightly awkward feature of permutation testing. If you are concerned that this is happening in your data, you can see that this sort of meta distribution is converging to a value, to a mean value, and we could imagine that this is like the true Z value. So if you're concerned about this uh, feature, then you can um, pick some number of iterations and run permutation testing over and over and over again, let's say 20 times, so a thousand permutations each, or a thousand iterations each time. And then you can take the average of all those distributions as your, um, as your kind of, uh, yeah, something that would approach a little bit more a, a smooth continuous distribution. So everything that we did now is just for one single data point, right? So I was just talking about um, permuting one single data point, but we have a whole time frequency space of data points. And so you have to repeat this uh, permutation testing procedure, all this um, shuffling and things. Um, for every single time frequency point in this entire um, plane.
So if you would look at uh, one single pixel, you have a distribution of null hypothesis, um, in this case, t-values, for um, each uh, individual pixel. Of course, you don't have to do this in a double loop. You do this in a, in a matrix. So it's not like I'm making it sound a bit uh, overly dramatic that you have to do it for every single time frequency point. It's all very fast, of course. But now this is nice because um, every pixel in this space gets its own um, statistical value and its own distribution of um, data points. So this distribution is just for a single time frequency point. And for a different time frequency point, this distribution is going to look uh, different. So it could be a different width, it could be a different mean. Um, and that's a very nice feature that, uh, or nice, it's a very powerful feature because it means that the statistics that are being, um, the, the, the procedure for evaluating the statistical significance of each pixel is based on um, the, the characteristics of the, data, of the data at that time frequency point. Um, so that's a very, uh, that's a very um, powerful feature. So here is um, some uh, time frequency map of um, power. And here I believe what I was testing is uh, the first third of the trials versus the last third of the trials or something like that. <clears throat> and so here based on um, uh, thresholding at, at 0.05, here you can see I outlined the regions where pixels um, exceeded the statistical um, criteria here, this threshold. Um, and here I'm showing the same map, um, but uh, rather than showing the whole um, raw map and then just highlighting the pixels that are significant with this black contour, you can see here some black contours here. Um, I just set all the non-significant um, pixels or all the pixels where the observed um, statistical value was was in this case, greater than the threshold or below the threshold on, on this side. Um, and I just set those all to zero, so then you just see the remaining um, significant results. Okay, so why don't we uh, switch over to MATLAB and take a look here. This is going to be using um, a data set called V1 uh, Laminar. These are uh, Laminar data that were recorded from the mouse uh, V1 during a task. Uh, that I'll, I'll explain in a minute when we see the data, then it'll make more sense what the task was. Um, these data, let's see, let's load them in. <clears throat> the data are called um, CSD, so it's a variable. It's still just like EEG, typical um, format. Um, so it's still channels by time by trials. And the only thing you need to know, or the, the main thing you need to know right now is that um, the 16 corresponds to um, 16 electrodes that are aligned in depth. So channel um, one is is the, the most the electrode that was penetrated most deeply into the brain, which is actually sitting in the in the hippocampus and dorsal hippocampus. And then it goes up through all the different cortical layers of V1. And channel 16 is actually a little bit outside the brain, um, so it's outside the head. And um, here I write that channel 7, somewhere around channel 7, is layer 4. This is like the primary thalamic input layer in, uh, in, um, in primary sensory cortex, like V1. Okay, so what we are going to do now is compare um, statistically the time frequency power at channel 9, which is a little bit uh, above layer 1, so it's like in, uh, a bit in superficial layers. Um, versus channel 5, which is a little bit deeper than layer 1, so it's around layer 4. Um, and yeah, so most of the rest of this code is fairly standard. Maybe the variables might, you know, be named slightly differently from what you've seen in previous uh, lectures, but it's all basically the same stuff. It's standard um, time frequency de uh, decomposition via complex Morley wavelet convolution. You can already tell that uh, I've left out a few lines of code here. So if you like, you can pause the video and see if you can complete, um, at least starting with this cell, some of these uh, lines here. All right, so this first one is for frequencies. This one's pretty easy. So we want to go from min freak to max freak and steps of num freaks. So I think that one's pretty easy. 
And remember, this is lin space. If we were doing log space, then we would have to do like log 10 of this and so forth. The next part that's missing is this S. So what is this S? This is the width of the Gaussian. So you can see that here's the Gaussian. We have e to the minus t squared over 2s squared. So we know that s is somehow based on uh, the number of cycles, and it has to be standardized by 2 pi f. So here we have a variable called n cycles. So it's going to be n cycles. And then, uh, and then actually this needs to be one, this is one per frequency, so it's n cycles for this frequency. Um, and then we want to scale this by 2 times pi times f. And of course, this also has to be done per frequency. So that seems to be correct. So now we have our wavelets. Um, and let's see, so now we, so here's where we, we do the actual convolution. We get the um, power spectrum of the data for these two channels. Um, initialize the time frequency matrix. So now notice, so often we just want the time frequency matrix average over trials. Um, but here we're going to be doing permutation testing. So we need access within this subject. So we need access to all the um, individual trials here. So we're going to make this time frequency matrix be two. This is for um, two electrodes by frequency, by time, and of course we're temporal, temporally downsampling the results here after convolution um, by the number of trials. <clears throat> so here we loop through frequencies. This is our standard convolution stuff. We take the power spectrum of the wavelet multiplied by the power spectrum of the data and then the inverse Fourier transform of that. So this is convolution. Cut off uh, the beginning and the end. Um, so we get back to a normal size. And here we reshape from this like super trial. You can see here's this reshape uh, thing. So we reshape this two dimensional time by trials matrix into a one by time trials matrix uh, vector. <clears throat> so here we reshape it back to be time by trials. And here we want to compute the power and um, or extract the power and, and put it into this matrix. So again, if you like, you can um, pause this, the video and see if you can fill in these two lines. So let's see, I think we want the magnitude of the analytic signal for the first channel. So that's this. And now you might be tempted to just uh, do something like this, take the power. But remember, we want to temporally downsample these results. So we want to do times to save uh, x. And so, um, so I think this line of code is going to work. So then I copy paste that here. And of course, this is really important. It's an easy mistake to make. Um, we want to change this variable to analytic signal two. So we're getting the right, uh, we're getting the right thing, the right channel. Um, and here at the bottom, I create this uh, diff map variable. So actually, let's first take a look at, at the size of time frequency. So this is um, channels by frequencies by time points uh, downsampled now by trials. So there's 200 trials in this, uh, in this uh, experiment. Now here what I'm doing is just computing the average of the um, trials for the second channel and then subtracting that from the average of the trials for the first channel. And I'm saving this in this, this matrix called diff map. And basically this is just so I don't have to write out this whole line of code a bunch of times. Okay, so now uh, we have a new data set, um, new data, and we're about to do statistics, but we haven't even looked at the data yet. So this should make you concerned, right? It's always important to have a good close look at the data. Um, of course, you know, in practice, so let me uh, change this bit. In practice, of course, you should uh, um, inspect the raw data before even getting this far. But, you know, in this case, you can trust me that the raw data look OK. So here we plot the um, power spectrum. And uh, so we can see for channel 9 and channel 5. So this is a little bit superficial. This is a little bit deep. And here's the difference between 
these two channels. So now let me tell you a little bit about what was happening in this experiment. So at time zero, there was a flash of light that appeared on the screen. It was like a, a high contrast checkerboard that appeared on the screen and that lasted for 500 milliseconds. And then there was a contrast reversal. So the, the same image was on the screen, but the, the black turned to white and white turned to black. And you see this nice, um, big, strong gamma band response um, in V1 to um, to the stimulus and in particular to the to the contrast reversal that gives this really big response. You can see a bit of a response here in the deeper layers as well, but it's obviously much weaker. These are on the same um, uh, color limits here, the same color scaling. Um, and you can see, so this is, yeah, I mean, you don't need the, the difference map to see the difference between these two, but you know, this just highlights that channel nine is a much stronger gamma response to uh, to this um, stimulus compared to channel 5. Okay, so this is important always to um, have a look at your data. Now in this cell we're going to dive into um, uh, permutation testing. Specify our p-value. This actually we don't need until um, a little bit later until we get to thresholding and plotting. So here we specify the number of permutations. We're going to do a thousand permutations. Here I'm going to initialize a null hypothesis um, matrix. So let's check out the size of this thing. So this is 1000 by 50 by 141. So this is um, permutations or iterations in, in the permutation testing by frequencies by um, downsample time points. So now what I'm going to do is create a new matrix um, where I will concatenate all the trials from the first channel on top of um, all the, the trials from the uh, or the second um, channel after the first channel. So let's take a look at this thing. So this is now a, um, remember this started off this TF uh, matrix was four dimensional. It was channels by frequencies by time by trials, 200 trials. And now this new matrix TF3D, this is frequency by time by 400 trials. So it's not that we got any new trials, but now the first 200 trials correspond to channel um, uh, five and the second, the next, uh, or I guess channel nine, actually, I forget. Uh, yeah, channel nine. Uh, and the second 200 trials, so trials 201 to 400, are from uh, channel the second channel, which is which is channel five here. Okay, so now this is where it actually gets a little bit tricky. What is our null hypothesis, and how do we create a situation in the data that would arise under the null hypothesis? So the null hypothesis here is that the all of these um, trials. So the, the null hypothesis is that the two channels have the same amount of activity, right? If the null hypothesis were true, that would mean that we could swap the labels. So we could call, we could pick any individual single trial and say that that was um, from, uh, from channel five or that was from channel nine. That would be a meaningless arbitrary uh, mapping. The way we are going to instantiate that here is by saying in the in the real world trials 1 through 200 are from channel 9 and trials 201 to 400 are from channel uh, 5. So if the null hypothesis were true we could actually s sort of you know swap around this third dimension and then still look at this difference map for the first 200 trials versus the last 200 trials. And if the null hypothesis were true, that wouldn't matter because the the fact that the we call the first 200 trials channel nine is just is just meaningless. It's just arbitrary. I hope that makes sense. So this is how we are going to implement our um, null hypothesis in this situation. Um, and so um, so here you can see how I'm going to do this is randomly uh, or generate a a vector of uh, permuted numbers up to the uh, number of trials. So that's going to look like this. So this is just a random order of, uh, of numbers from one up to 
the number of trials, which is the size of the third dimension. And now I'm going to create this new temp matrix, which is um, the, 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 the real data, but with the, um, the trial order um, swapped around. And now for the, the permutation, now we are going to take the average of the first 200 trials versus um, trials 201 to 200, or sorry, to uh, 400. So, and now this goes through um, a thousand times. So you can see actually that this line is very similar to this line, this diff map thing. Here, so I, you know, it's it, I'm taking it from a different matrix, but um, essentially I'm computing the same uh, difference map, except that here all of the labels between um, channel one and channel two have, or I guess I should say channel nine and channel five have been uh, randomly swapped. Okay, so now what we've done, let me see, I'll go back here. So we've done this swapping now, and we've done this swapping uh, a thousand times. And now what I want to do is find, determine the distance of this, uh, the observed value, so without any shuffling, away from the center of this distribution. And the way we do that is, um, in this case, we will define this to be a normal um, Z value. So we take this thing, my, the observed value minus the mean of this null hypothesis distribution and divide by the standard deviation of this null hypothesis distribution. So that you can see here, I'm creating the mean map um, from the, so the mean of the permutation maps and then the standard deviation of the permutation maps. And here we z-score the data, so we're creating the z-map variable, which is the, the observed uh, effect size, so this is just the difference in power values, minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. Now you can see that, uh, let, me, let me first run these guys. Now we can see that one of the interesting things about this variable or this procedure is the mean and the standard deviation map, these are different at each time frequency point. Right, so that means that we, are, we can uh, do the statistical evaluation based on the unique statistical properties, the characteristics of the data at each time frequency point. That's actually very, uh, this, is, this is powerful because we don't need to assume that the data have the same exact distribution at three hertz compared to 100 hertz because they're not going to. They're gonna have different distributions, different characteristics, different smoothing characteristics, different um, variability, different magnitudes, um, different frequencies for different time points. And so with this procedure, we don't need to assume that this data point here works the same way as this data point here. So that's very nice. Okay, and now what we do is we take this said map um, and we say any value that's smaller than, uh, than our Z value, and this is actually just converted from the P value. So this is the, the standard deviation unit that corresponds to P less than 0.05. And I take the absolute value of this Z map because we want to do a two-tailed test. If any value is below uh, our threshold, then we set that value to zero. Okay. And now we make a plot. So this is just the normal um, power data, uh, the, the difference uh, map. This is the same map, but uh, the significant regions are highlighted. So you can see it's a little bit uh, difficult to interpret, right? Because the highlighting, the yeah, these contours are just kind of going everywhere. You don't know whether, you know, this is the significant region or this is the significant region. Here you see it a bit better. Um, so this shows uh, the, the, the statistical values where power is greater for channel nine compared to channel five. And here um, in red is where the power is greater for channel five compared to channel nine. So you look at this result, maybe you think, well, you know, this is a little bit, no it looks a little bit too much, right? There's effects that seem to be very small. Maybe, you know, probably these are just alpha errors. You probably don't want to interpret these kinds of things and they still seem to be significant. And, you know, look at this tiny little dot right here. 
Um, so here, you know, you can probably already guess that there is a multiple comparisons uh, problem that we need to address. This is not addressing this. Here we are showing the data thresholded at 0.05, not corrected for multiple comparisons. In fact, if you look further down the script, there's already code for doing uh, corrections for multiple comparisons, but I'm not going to talk about that in this lecture because this is already getting a bit long, so that's going to be uh, moved to the next lecture. Um, so stay tuned, this is very exciting.